Okay, so we're getting ready to do chapter 20, which is nutritional support in IV therapy. Okay, so nutritional support about nutrition, but the reasons for nutritional support is people can't eat or drink, whether it's because of illness or surgery or injury, like if they have cancer in the of the neck or the throat or the mouth, or maybe they have some a uh, neurological problem that uh, they're not able to swallow very well or they can have a severe chewing problem, uh, refusal to eat or drink, uh, you know, some uh, psych disorders or um, like anorexia nervosa or something, those are ref all refusals to eat uh, or they're, they're just unable to meet their nutritional needs like someone who's in advanced uh, chronic lung disease, they simply use all their energy to breathe. Um, so, you know, they may not be able to meet their nutritional needs. And again, cancer, again, could be another uh, issue here. And food can't pass from the mouth into the stomach or the small intestines for whatever reason. So we give them what's called nutritional support. We're going to basically feed them via another route. They're not going to have to chew it or usually they're not going to have to swallow it, but now they're always at risk because we're not doing this the normal way, okay? So nutritional support or intravenous, uh, which is IV therapy, it's always ordered by the doctor to meet the food and fluid needs of the patient, and we always get a dietitian involved in this process because she's the one who really actually figures up, does the uh, back kind of the background kind of stuff and she's going to figure out how many calories this person needs as well as how much fluid they need um, for their body size and weight. So enteral nutrition is giving nutrients into the GI tract through a feeding tube and GI means gastrointestinal. So we do this through what's called a nasal gastric tube or an NG tube and there's several types of nasal gastric tubes and one of them um, the nasal gastric tube, when you first think of it, it's, it's more of a, it's a very firm plastic um, tubing and we can use it not only to put something into the stomach, we can use it to take something out of the stomach um, we could, by adding suction to it. Um, another thing uh, we use is called a nasoenteral tube and I know them by Dobhoff. They're called, it's, but Dobhoff is just a brand name. And this tube is really, really long. It's small. It, you know, it bypasses the stomach. That's the main thing. And it's there's it either sits in the, and it sits in the small intestine, and it'll either sit in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, or the jejunum, which is the second, the middle part of the small intestine. Um, but they're both naso uh, enteral tubes, and so they go down your nose. They go down your throat, through down through the esophagus, and into the area it's supposed to be. The J, uh, the gastrostomy tube goes uh, into through the abdomen directly into the stomach. Um, and your book gives you a, um, a picture of all of these. And uh, the gastrostomy tube usually has a balloon on the end of it, so the nurse can actually change this out if it gets occluded. And a jejunostomy tube to the abdomen that goes directly into the jejunum. And then there's this thing called the PEG tube, which is percutaneous endoscopic, endoscopic gastrostomy tube. It also is like the gastrostomy tube in that it goes directly through the abdomen into the stomach, but it's sutured in. So the nurse can't remove that. Um, he, they usually have to go through outpatient to get that changed if it becomes occluded. And they all have the potential of becoming occluded, which means they get stopped up. So what we put through the tube feeding then, or through the tubes, are feedings by formulas. And there's different types of formulas and um, the doctor will order the type of formula and the amount to give and when to give the tube feedings. And of course, he gets this assistance from the dietitian. So, but the nurse actually administers it through the feeding tube. It's always given at room temperature to prevent cramping. Um, we give them at certain times and it can be like a scheduled feeding. So I might give a feeding say at eight o'clock, 12 o'clock, uh, four o'clock, and then I might give one near bedtime, okay? 
or it could be intermittent feedings where an intermittent feeding is a little bit different. It's usually on the pump and I'm going to start it at 8 p.m. and I'm going to let it run all night and I'm going to stop it at 6 a.m. That's an intermittent feeding. And then there are the continuous feedings which are over a 24-hour period. And mostly with the intermittent feedings and the uh, continuous feedings, we use a feeding pump. Uh, the other ones, the scheduled feedings, are usually like a can or maybe a, a can and a half. It'll, the order will tell you, but that's usually considered, uh, we can usually do that what's called a bolus feeding. And a bolus feeding means it's just given all at one time. So basically, I would have it all connected up to a syringe. If you ever get to watch one, it's kind of interesting for the, you know, see it for the first time. And you would pour the feeding in and then you, you have to flush it afterwards with some water because again they have to have water and you would put that in through that syringe and it would just go in by gravity and it's pretty quick probably to, um, takes maybe around 10-15 minutes tops unless you run into a problem which you never have to give the feedings but you might see it given or you might assist the nurse uh, maybe positioning the patient or whatever um, if you have a patient with a with a tube feeding, then you want to make sure that you uh, report the following: if they are having nausea or vomiting, if they're complaining of any kind of discomfort or they look like they're in pain, uh, or if they have any complaints of indigestion or heartburn, uh, if their abdomen looks real poochy and it's not usually that that way, it's called a distended abdomen. So you would want to report that. Uh, if they do a lot of coughing, because this can displace, uh, if they do a lot of coughing or sneezing or vomiting, that, that can actually displace uh, the tube, especially the nasogastric tubes or the Dobhoffs. Um, so, and they have to be in a certain position. So, you would want to make sure you would report that. Any type of redness, swelling, drainage, odor, or pain at the ostomy side, especially on the abdomen, if they have a fever or an increased pulse rate, if they if they look like they're having trouble breathing. Uh, so, any type of respiratory distress, and if they have diarrhea especially the diarrhea with the formulas. And we always start out the formulas diluted. We don't ever give them full strength because that will cause diarrhea. And then we increase the strength of the formula. So we dilute it with water. So when, when I say increase with strength, it's just gonna be more formula, less water until it gets to full strength. Uh, and then if they have uh, complaints of flatulence, which is gas. Okay, so preventing aspiration, um, that's one of the major risks of tube feedings is the aspiration. And aspiration means they are going to suck something down their windpipe, which isn't supposed to be there. Now, if it gets down into the lungs, it causes damage and pneumonia can set up and it can even, uh, if it's not corrected or prevented, it can cause the person death. So. Aspiration can occur during insertion. Um, and what happens here is the tube goes into the wrong place. It goes into the lungs instead of the esophagus. Um, if they do, like I said, if they do a lot of coughing, sneezing, um, uh, vomiting, that can move the tube out of place too. And that puts them at increased risk for aspiration because um, they can depending on the displacement of where it occurs. And then from regurgitation, you know, and that's like, you know, you've regurgitated before. It just kind of comes up and uh, if they don't have, especially if they have swelling difficulties, they already have problems. So um, it, it really becomes quite a, a, a job and a risk that they're taking with the two feedings. So you have to be really careful, basically. So to assist the nurse in this process uh, of preventing regurgitation and aspiration, we sit them up in the Fowler's or the semi-Fowler's position before the feeding and it'll be after the feeding as well. So you just follow the care plan and the nurse's direction. Um, we maintain that Fowler's or semi-Fowler's position after feeding. Sometimes we maintain it at all times, depending 
remember, depending if it's not continuous, then they have to be in this position all the time. If it's scheduled, then maybe not so much. Um, but again, follow the care plan and the nurse's direction. And we avoid the left sideline because that uh, prevents the stomach from emptying well. So mainly, it doesn't mean that they'll never lay on the left side, you guys. It just means we try to limit um, the time they're on that left side. Comfort measures. Um, persons uh, with feeding tubes usually are NPO. So that means they, are, they get nothing by mouth. That's what NPO means. And um, um, they also get dry mouth or dry lips or sore throat that can all cause discomfort. So you have to do a lot of oral care with these people. And um, feeding tubes can really irritate or cause pressure on the nose, especially if they're the NG tubes. So you've got to look at the skin and, the, and their nares. The no, nar nose is, medical term for nose is nares. Um, you have one on each side of your nose there. It goes right on up. And that can change the shape of the nostrils, and it can cause pressure areas there. So you would want to check that. And, you know, let's face it, you know, you get boogies in your nose and sometimes you got to clean your nose out. So at some point, um, you know, that can happen. You might have to do that too. You do that gently with a Q-tip. Um, that's what you can reach and see. Anyway, um, getting off track here. Um, the following, let's see, you, you, so you have to clean the nose and the nostrils every four to eight hours. You got to secure the tube to the nose because we sweat and we also have sebaceous oil on our faces and our noses. So it becomes kind of greasy and it can work its way off the, the tape can. Um, and then we have to, so we have to watch that. And then we have to secure the tube to the person's garment at the shoulder area so that it prevents pulling on the tube. That's why it's connected there. Uh, and most of the time, you're there to assist. Uh, it, and again, it falls on the nurse's shoulders to make sure this happens. But then you're there too. Your part is to assist. Whether and you know, we do nurse aides do clean noses and nostrils, and you know, report things that are uh, abnormal to the nurse, or even when they're normal, we like to report those. I want to hear that too because I want to know things are okay with your why you were duty. Now, if I go through there and find something and you didn't tell me, I'm going to say, okay, did you know? I'm going to ask, start asking you questions. Um, it's not a story, but it's, I have to do an event. It's basically, I have to do an investigation because, you know, when something happens, then I have to find out why. So when you have a tube feed, you, you may assist with it. And in some states, a nursing assistants give tube feedings and remove NG tubes. Not in the state of Kentucky, they don't. Um, but uh, every state is different. So again, you would have to know your scope of practice. So you are never responsible for inserting feeding tubes or checking their placement. That's still the nurse's job. So let's get the next slide here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the parenteral nutrition or total or TPN, total parenteral nutrition, it's called TPN or hyperalimentation. We're going to cover that next. Now this is giving nutrients through a catheter inserted into a vein, so it's intravenous. And this method is used when the person can't receive um, feedings enteral feedings, uh, whether that's oral or the, in, or the tube feedings, they can't receive it through the gut, basically. So TPN um, is given intravenous. It has to be in a great big vein. So it's usually a really, um, it's either like a pick line. They could use a pick line to give TPN through, or they can use like a one of the great big veins, and usually that that uh, insertion site is either in the neck or it's on the chest. Um, so this is a really nutrient dense solution that's given directly into the bloodstream. Um, 
so it doesn't enter through the GI tract, so that's where the para means. It para means beyond and enteral relates to the bowels, so beyond the bowels. Um, but the solution contains water, it contains protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and uh, it's always on a feet, it's always on an IV pump. And a lot of times we use this uh, for different disease processes or injury or surgery of the GI tract. Or sometimes it can be from severe trauma or infection. They use TPN a, way, a lot more than when I first got out of school. Um, but uh, being NPO for more than five or seven days that you might have to have a TPN and uh, there's just various reasons that they can have this um, this uh, nutrition. But the risk include infection, fluid imbalances, and blood sugar imbalances. So a lot of times if they're on the TPN, which most of the time you see this, I won't say you won't see it in long-term care, but it would be in the in the skilled nursing part and or maybe a like a rehab unit or something like that you don't it's not a common thing that i see in long-term care facilities not that it can't be there i'm just saying it, it's more i see it more in acute care settings um but depending on what type of facility you work for, you can see a whole lot more of it. But the big risk here for this type of nutrition includes infection, fluid imbalances, and blood sugar imbalances because it has a lot of sugar. And so what I was saying, got it got off track, but I was saying is you might see the nurses uh, do blood sugars on someone who's not a diabetic, but it's because they're receiving this type of nutrition. Now, the things you would want to report this time, again, would be fever, chills, any signs or symptoms of infection, and uh, any signs or symptoms of sugar imbalances. And depending if your sugar is low or high, uh, you would see different types of symptoms. Like if your sugar is low, then you could see where they would be kind of pale and sweaty and they might complain of being hungry. Um, they can even get sick of their stomach. On the other hand, if their sugar is high, they get flushed. They get a flushed appearance. They can still have the vomiting depending on how high the blood sugar is. Um, but they look differently. They won't be pale and sweaty. They'll be flushed and um, sick of their stomach, they get nauseated, that type of thing. They could have, if they report any type of change or difficulty breathing, or if they look like they're having breathing problems, you would report that. Again, that, there's that cough again. Uh, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, thirst. Uh, thirst is part of the high blood sugar. They would be thirsty all the time rapid heart rate or an irregular heart rate or heartbeat, weakness or fatigue, which means they just feel super, super tired, sweating, pallor, pallor is pale, or trembling and confusion, or any type of change in their behavior. You would report any of those things. So caring for a person with TPN, um, basically the nurse is responsible for all aspects of this nutrition period. And basically you would just assist them by carefully observing the person for any of those abnormal things. And then um, just helping the, helping the nurse meet the person's basic needs and activities of daily living. Going to the bathroom, ADLs. So intravenous therapy, IV therapy or IV infusion. Again, the doc you have to have a doctor's order for IV therapy. And, and this just basically provides fluid when they can't be taken by the mouth. Um, it replaces minerals and vitamins lost because of the illness or injury, and it will, can provide sugar for energy. And uh, we use it also to give drugs and or blood. So the RNs are completely responsible for IV therapy. Again, you're not responsible for it. And what we use to give IV therapy, um, 
give it peripherally, like what you see usually see in the hospital when it's in their arm or their hands, that's a peripheral vein. Or it can be on the chest or the neck through the central through a through a very large vein, like we would give the TPNs, so that it's called a central venous site. So those are usually on the chest or in the neck. Uh, peripheral sites are away in the center of the body and central sites are close to the heart. That's the differences in the vein size. Equipment that you would see, um, usually the solutions in a plastic bag used to be um, glass and I won't tell you you'll never see glass because we give lipids through glass bottles, but most solutions are in a plastic bag. A catheter is, is inserted into the vein. Um, there the IV tube or the infusion tubing connects the IV bag to the catheter and then that fluid drips from the bag into the drip chamber. And the clamp, there you'll find a clamp, um, or there's usually a couple one, there's a slide one and then there's the roller clamp. The roller clamp is what we use to regulate the flow on a gravity um, IV. And then the IV bags have an IV pole or some places call it, call it an IV stand or a ceiling hook. And I'm sure most of you have seen uh, the equipment used with intravenous um, equipment if you've been in any type of medical setting. So the flow rate is just this number of drops per minute. Okay, that's really all I want you to know about the flow rate. Although it goes in about how to set it and gives you the, um, it gives you the little formula to do it, you're never going to do that. The RN's going to do that. In the state of Kentucky, we take care of the IVs. The nurse does. All you have to do is if the IV alarm is going off and you hear it, you need to tell the nurse the IV alarm's going off. Okay? Um, if you go in and if it's a gravity, um, if it's a gravity IV, it means it doesn't have a pump connected to it, and you notice that the fluid isn't dripping, or it looks like it's going in too fast or too slow, or they're having pain at the site of the at the insertion site, or if it looks all puffy, or if it's if it's leaking, then those are the things that you would report to the nurse. And that's really all you got to know about the flow rate. Now, assisting with the IV therapy. Um, Again, you always follow the policies and procedures of the center, and the nurse will change the dressings. All those dressings she'll be responsible for. She'll have to know when they're due. You are never responsible for starting or maintaining an IV therapy of any type. You are not responsible for regulating the flow rate. You are not responsible for changing the bags, and you are not responsible for giving blood or IV drugs. And that would really be way out of your scope of practice. So if anyone was to ever ask you to do that, you should refuse because that's not within your scope of practice. So again, basically, we provide nutritional support or IV therapy for the very ill or those who cannot um, maintain their own nutrition and fluid needs. And so again, you want, if you have any problems, you want to talk to the nurse, um, and that's basically all we need to know about intravenous therapy. Basically, your um, responsibilities will be assisting with basic quality of life issues, okay? Um, but Oral care is extremely important. Nary's care is extremely important, especially if you've got an NG tube. Um, and I think that's everything for this chapter. I'll talk, see, talk to you soon.